frequently asked questions among people making a will is this, when do I need a lawyer? Here are 14 fairly common situations in which a lawyer's help is definitely called for, no matter how comfortable you might otherwise feel about preparing your own will. One, you should consult a lawyer if the value of the combined estate of you and your spouse, including life insurance, retirement benefits, and joint property, exceeds $600,000 as of 1992. Above $600,000, you need estate planning to avoid or minimize federal estate taxes. With proper planning, you can avoid federal estate tax on amounts of up to $1,200,000 through the Unified Credit Exemption. Consult your lawyer, and he will help you arrange your affairs to take advantage of this exemption. Two, you should consult a lawyer if you have a child who is not a natural or adopted child of your present spouse. Three, you should consult a lawyer if you have custody of minor children by a previous marriage, and if your former spouse would want custody if you die, or if you do not want him or her to have custody. Your former spouse will normally be entitled to custody unless he or she is unfit or has abandoned the children. Four, you should consult a lawyer if you plan to leave your spouse less than half of your entire estate. Common law states protect spouses from being disinherited by enabling them under many circumstances to receive a share of an estate. This share can vary from one-third to one-half of the estate's total value. The provisions of your will would control the remaining portion. Five, you should consult a lawyer if you plan to disinherit a child. Six, you should consult a lawyer if you have an illegitimate child or if a deceased child of yours has had illegitimate children. Seven, you should consult a lawyer if you're uncertain of your marital status. Common law marriages are those in which an unmarried couple is considered married because they have lived together as husband and wife for a set number of years. They are only recognized in 14 states and the District of Columbia. You cannot depend on your common law partner inheriting under state law unless you make a will. Also, if you've been divorced, make sure you have a decree which proves this so your ex-spouse doesn't receive property against your wishes. Eight, you should consult a lawyer if you're uncertain of your domicile. The law defines your domicile as the place where you have your primary home. You may live in one state for quite a while and retain your domicile in another if you have a home there to which you intend to return. By law, you are allowed only one domicile at any given time. Nine. You should consult a lawyer if you need to make special arrangements for the care of a handicapped person. 10. You should consult a lawyer if you suspect someone may challenge your will. 11. You should consult a lawyer if you own or operate a business that's a substantial part of your estate. You must have a plan for selling, continuing, or winding up the business that protects its value to your heirs. 12. You should consult a lawyer if you, your spouse, or your children receive benefits from or control an existing trust other than simple bank account trusts. 13. You should consult a lawyer if you and your spouse disagree about the ownership status of major assets. And finally, 14. You should consult a lawyer if you live in Louisiana. Because of its French heritage, Louisiana has rather different inheritance laws and will formalities. <laughs> Earlier on this tape, we mentioned the witnesses to your will. I want to make a couple of points very clear. If you do your own will, please have it properly signed and witnessed. If you do not, your will could be invalid. You should have three witnesses, and they should not be beneficiaries under the will. For example, your spouse shouldn't witness your will, nor should a friend who will receive a gift of property or cash under your will. If you are elderly, it's better if your witnesses are younger so they're likely to survive you. It's also better if your witnesses live in your area and are likely to remain there. That makes it easier for your personal representative to contact them when you die. If you choose to prepare your own will, 
After it is completed, these are the steps you should follow. 1. Gather three witnesses together and tell them that the document is your will and that you want them to be witnesses to your signing it. You do not have to let them read the will. 2. Making sure they can all see you and each other sign the will. Sign only one copy. I suggest that the maker of the will initial each page to prevent unauthorized changes. 3. Have the witnesses sign the will at the end under their statement and then print their names and addresses. If you initial the pages of your will, the witnesses should initial those pages too. And 4. Celebrate your completion of this important task. Finishing the work of making out your will and having it duly witnessed doesn't fully complete the process. It's very important that your will be stored in a safe place where you are certain nothing will happen to it in case of robbery, fire, or natural disaster. It also needs to be someplace where it can be retrieved in the event of your death. If you don't put your will in a safe place after you've signed it, you may have done all the work for nothing. Do not store the signed original of your will in a safe deposit box. In many states, safe deposit boxes are sealed by the tax authorities upon the death of the owner. This could make it difficult for your representative to gain access to your will and delay the distribution of your estate. Keep the signed original in a safe place in your home and make certain that someone knows where to find your will after your death. Be sure to tell your personal representative and next of kin where you put it. Also, keep a copy for your own convenient reference. You may want to give your personal representative and or your attorney a copy as well. Remember that only your original counts as your will. Please remember this. Do not alter your will after you have signed it. Once your will has been signed, do not mark the original in any way. If you wish to make changes to your will after you have signed it, you must sign a codicil, which is a document amending your will, or you must make a new will. You may want to consult with a lawyer if you want to alter or make a new will. Are there times when a person should consider making a new will? There definitely are. I can think of at least six occasions when you would want to make a new will. One, if your marital status changes. Obviously, if you're married, divorced, or widowed, the terms of your will are very likely to change. The second reason to make a new will would be if you add a child to the family through natural birth or adoption. Reason number three would be the death of any of the beneficiaries unless you have designated alternate beneficiaries. Number four, rewrite your will if there has been a significant change in your assets or their value. A fifth reason to rewrite your will would be your choice for guardian, trustee, or personal representative changes, or the person you've designated is no longer willing or able to serve. And finally, if you move from a common law to a community property state, or vice versa, you will want to make a new will to protect your heirs. In addition, you should review your will every few years to see if it still expresses your wishes, even if you think things haven't changed very much. You will also want to have your will reviewed any time you move to a new state, even though it may turn out that a new will is not needed. Let me stress again that any changes to your will must be made either by codicil or by making a new will. My lawyer told me that funeral and burial instructions could be put in my will, but that it might be better to put them in a letter because wills often aren't found immediately after death. I thought they had to be in your will if you wanted to be sure they were carried out. Your attorney is absolutely right. As I said earlier, your safe deposit box may be sealed at the time of your death and not opened until after your funeral. When it comes to the disposition of your body and the funeral arrangements you want or don't want, 
It is important that your family, particularly your spouse and personal representative, know your wishes. I recommend that you tell them in addition to writing a letter. The same goes for gifts of body parts, care of pets which may survive you, and other immediate arrangements that must be made. Keep any such instructional letters with your important papers where they may easily be found. I've heard a great deal about the benefits of trusts. Can you give me some more information about them? A trust is nothing more than a legal instrument used to manage real or personal property. One person normally establishes it for the benefit of another. To understand how a trust works, it might be helpful to discuss its origins, which go back to the 13th century. At that time, a group of Franciscan brothers was caught in a bind. These religious people had to take a vow of poverty. At the same time, they needed money to live on. This predicament was resolved by the creation of a fund, which technically they didn't own or run, but the income from which they were legally entitled to. This fund is now what we know as a trust. Today, people usually create them to provide for their children and for their charitable interests. The modern trust works on basically the same principles as those in the 13th century. If you keep in mind the following three definitions, you'll have a much easier time understanding the various trusts. First, the person who owns the property and wishes to create a trust is called the trustor. Second, the person who manages or controls the trust property is called the trustee. Third, the person receiving benefits from a trust is called the beneficiary. A common type of trust is a testamentary trust. A testamentary trust is a fund established by a will and administered by a trustee named in the will. This type of trust does not go into effect until the person who made the will dies. If you have minor children, you may want to establish this type of trust for any property that you want to pass on to them. The purpose of this is to prevent the children from receiving their entire inheritance when they turn 18. You choose the age at which they will inherit, and you name the person or institution to administer the trust. In addition, you may want a trust for your adult children or adult grandchildren to delay the age at which they receive their inheritance. If you create a trust, you should make sure that your trustee is someone who is financially responsible and concerned about your children's welfare. Also, your trustee should be someone who is likely to remain living through the time the trust might end. You might want to ask the person you've designated as guardian to serve as trustee also. As with guardians, one is better than two, but do select at least one alternate in case your first choice can't or won't serve. Your particular circumstances are what determine whether a trust may be appropriate for you. Trusts are most commonly used to provide for a relative without giving that person property outright, but trusts can also support pets, scholarships, memorials, or research, almost anything. Judge Wapner, what is a living trust? A living or inter vivos trust is one that is put into effect while the trustor is alive in contrast to a testamentary trust which is made in a person's will and takes effect after death. To create a living trust, you would simply transfer property or money into a trust fund and appoint a trustee to administer it. The trustee would then manage the fund and distribute income from the trust to the beneficiaries according to the terms that you have specified. One of the biggest advantages of a living trust is that since it is established before your death, the property in it doesn't have to go through the probate process under your will. Because of this, trust property usually passes more quickly to beneficiaries than probate property. Living trusts may be classified as revocable, 
or irrevocable, depending on whether the trustor retains the power to change or revoke them. The difference between these two types of living trusts is important partly because of certain tax implications. Property in a revocable trust is treated for tax purposes as still belonging to the trustor, that is, to the person who created the trust. The logic behind the rule is that a person hasn't really given anything away if he can take it back whenever he wants. Irrevocable trusts, on the other hand, are usually used by those with very large estates to take advantage of potentially significant tax savings. There are three major benefits of a revocable living trust. First, a revocable living trust can avoid probate costs, delays, and publicity. As mentioned earlier, property placed in a living trust does not have to go through the delays of probate court under your will. Furthermore, trust assets also aren't included in the probate estate for purposes of calculating the fees of attorneys or the executor, nor in determining the type of probate administration that is going to be necessary. Second, unlike probate court files, living trust documents and property do not become part of the public record. Third, a living trust can smooth the transfer of financial management from an elderly person without the need for guardianship proceedings. A living trust can also allow the trustor to test the ability of the prospective trustee, guardian, or personal representative and make whatever changes might be indicated. Despite the benefits, revocable living trusts also have several disadvantages. You still need a will for property that can't go in the trust, such as vehicles and clothes. Legal fees are higher to set up a living trust and a will than they are for a will alone. It can be a nuisance having the trust property not in your own name anymore. There will still be some delays in distributing trust property to make sure all your debts get paid. The living trust can be challenged just like a will can be challenged. If your financial position makes an irrevocable living trust a real option. You can use it to reduce taxes, avoid the necessity of drawn out court proceedings, and transfer financial management. You can also retain some use of trust property. Remember, when you put your property in an irrevocable trust, it is no longer yours. Property isn't counted for estate tax purposes, and you don't pay income tax on interest earned by the property unless the interest has been paid to you. There are many special types of trusts with fancy names that try to combine the tax advantages of an irrevocable trust with the flexibility and control of a revocable one. Many of these are quite complex. Get advice from an attorney any time that you are considering setting up a trust. Can I set up a trust for the care of my pet dog, Sophie, after I die? In most cases, you can, but be sure to check if your state has any special requirements for this type of trust. If your state laws are fairly strict, you may want to consider putting money in trust for someone with the condition that the money will be distributed to that person as long as he takes care of your pet. I'm always hearing about how to avoid probate, but I'm unclear as to what it is. Probate is really no more than the process whereby a court decides whether or not a will is valid and oversees the accurate distribution of the property. Someone, usually the person you choose as the personal representative under the supervision of a court, accounts for all your property, pays your debts, and your taxes and distributes what remains according to the terms of your will or state law. There may be quite a bit of paperwork, but that's all it really amounts to. Traditional probate procedures have tended to be lengthy, complex, and expensive. Fortunately, many states have simplified procedures for most estates so that with a lawyer's help, the average person shouldn't have too much difficulty 
serving as the executor or personal representative. Let's take a closer look at what would be involved if you were named as executor or if you volunteered to be the administrator. You begin the probate process by submitting the will, if there is one, to the probate court in the decedent's county and notifying relatives, heirs, and creditors of the death. The court will issue you letters of administration. They give you the authority to act on behalf of the estate. Once appointed, you will probably want to select a lawyer to help you. You, not the deceased person or the court, choose the lawyer. Make sure it is someone you feel comfortable with and confident about. Settle on the fees in advance. They are always negotiable. Percentage fees set by state law are always maximums. You may also have some choice of probate procedures, such as supervised or unsupervised or small estate. The least formal procedure for which the estate is eligible is usually the most desirable choice. You next need to locate all of the property of the deceased, determine its value, collect any property owed the estate, and pay any outstanding debts. How long this takes and how difficult it is depends, of course, on the size and type of estate. Professional appraisals may be needed for real estate, jewelry, furniture, and art. As the personal representative, you are responsible not only for paying state and inheritance taxes, but also for completing and filing the deceased person's final federal and state income tax returns. Very few estates will owe federal estate tax, but most states have an inheritance tax that will vary. Sometimes the estate pays it, and sometimes it is the responsibility of the heirs. In the end, an heir may or may not pay tax, depending upon his relationship to the decedent, the instructions of the will, and the amount of property which the heir receives. Your attorney will be able to clarify this. You cannot distribute estate property to the heirs until you have receipts showing that all taxes have been paid and until you have filed a final account with the probate court and the court makes an order of distribution. There is always a waiting period during which people can object to what you've done, but sometimes an objection will be raised after you have distributed the property. In any case, once you've filed the accounting and distributed the property and the waiting period has expired, the estate is settled and your responsibility as personal representative ends. Sounds like a lot of work. My dad put me down as executor of his estate. Now I'm not sure if I can do the job. Of course you can. It's pretty simple, really. But if you still feel uneasy, remember this. Most personal representatives have never served before and know less than you do now. Your lawyer is familiar with the process, and you can rely on him as little or as much as you need to. Probate clerks and judges are used to dealing with inexperienced personal representatives. Having a bank or professional as personal representative is common only for very large estates. Find an attorney that you can work with, and you'll do just fine. Judge Wapner, my brother left me $25,000 in his will, but he didn't leave our sister a penny. Can she contest the will and win? Just because she's your sister does not by itself give her the right to challenge the will. Instead, your sister must prove that your brother made the will under undue influence or lack of competence or that the will is fraudulent. If she does have the necessary grounds to contest the will, she must go to court and file a petition stating her reasons. The court will then grant a hearing to determine if the will should be declared invalid. As always, the general information provided in this talk is not a substitute for legal advice from a lawyer. 
For specific advice based on your own individual circumstances, see the lawyer of your choice. You may want to listen to the talk on You and Your Lawyer for assistance in selecting and working with an attorney. Thank you.